few years ago, I led a pilgrimage to the Holy Land with a small group of seminarians. In order to feel prepared to say anything meaningful about the trip, I felt compelled to read everything I could get my hands on about the place that's so central to the stories of scripture, Christian history, and geopolitics. Along with travel guides and history texts and books on the theology of pilgrimage, I found myself totally captivated by Simon Sabag Montefiore's book, Jerusalem, the Biography. I was drawn to his portrait of a city with so many different lives, personalities, and stories. To underscore its tumultuous past, and maybe to understand its tumultuous present, Montefiore begins with a description of the city under siege by the Romans in AD 70. At this time, Jerusalem was a city of perhaps a half a million residents. It was surrounded by four legions, roughly 60,000 Roman troops, that were led by Titus, son of Emperor Vespasian. During the siege, the conditions in the city were dire. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus describes how, during the siege, zealots within the city had burned all the grain stores, effectively catalyzing a widespread famine. Without any help from the Romans, competing factions within the besieged Jerusalem were engaged in open conflict with one another. Lawlessness, brutality, and hunger reigned in the streets. AD 70 wasn't the first siege that Jerusalem's walls had endured. The Babylonians laid siege in 587 BC and before them the Assyrians in 701 BC. Of the Babylonian siege, later in his book, Montefiore interprets the words of Jeremiah and Lamentations to convey a disheartening scene, and I'm going to quote from Montefiore here. The famine, wrote Jeremiah, was sore in the city. Young children faint for hunger at the top of every street, and there were hints of cannibalism. Even the rich were soon desperate, wrote the author of Lamentations. They that were brought up in scarlet embraced dunghills, searching for food. People wander the streets, dazed like blind men. Archaeologists have found a sewer pipe that dated from the siege. The Judeans usually lived on lentils, wheat, and barley, but the pipe's contents show that people were living on plants and herbs, diseased with whipworm and tapeworm, end quote. Taken in composite, such ancient siege practices were intended to lock down the inhabitants of a city and starve them of food and freedom and communication in order to force surrender. Walking through the streets of modern-day Jerusalem with my students, it wasn't hard to imagine what it would have been like to have felt trapped in your own home, confined by walls of your own building, under threat from a powerful enemy who was biding their time while you slowly wasted away. Weeks after the pilgrimage ended, Psalm 31 appeared in the daily office lectionary, and I found myself almost tripping over verse 21. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his love in a besieged city. The passage sticks with me whenever it comes up in the lectionary, and I've wondered what kind of spiritual strength it would take to find the wonders of God's love in a besieged city, knowing how dire life under siege would have been. While here in New York City in March of 2020, there aren't hordes of Assyrians, Babylonians, or legions of Romans waiting on the other side of the East River or the Hudson, I can't help but feel like I'm living in a kind of siege at the moment. The pause order from the governor's office, which like so many other shelter-in-place orders throughout the country, shuts down all non-essential businesses, closes schools, churches, parks, restaurants, bars, clubs, cinemas, and theaters, and it bans any gatherings and mandates public distancing of six feet. Living in New York City during the COVID-19 pandemic, may be as close to living in a city under siege as I, if I am fortunate, will ever experience. It's hard to say with any certainty the context to which Psalm 31 was written to. Indeed, many scholars argue that Psalm 31 is a composite of different kinds of psalmic material, with at least two parts, the first half being a, a prolonged prayer of deliverance from verses 1 to 18, the second half is a prayer of doxology, or praise to God, in response to the deliverance that was requested in the first half of the psalm. As I read the psalm, as we did this morning, I keep coming back to verse 21, and in particular, the phrase, the wonders of God's love in a besieged city. The word translated here as love in the Book of Common Prayer is the Hebrew word chesed, 
Chesed is a deeply wound and theologically significant term that's often difficult to translate into English. When William Coverdale translated the first full English version of the Bible, he translated chesed as loving kindness, a practice that continues in many modern translations today. His intent was to convey something that goes beyond love, a concept that reflects something of the unending commitment of God to God's people. It may be that the concept of chesed has more to do with another deeply significant theological word, grace. And indeed, as Luther was translating the Hebrew and Greek Bibles into German, he chose to use the same German word to convey the meaning of chesed and charis, gnade, which means mercy or grace in German. As you might imagine, the Church has had quite a lot to say about grace in 2,000 years. We could appeal to Paul or Augustine, Aquinas or Luther, or any number of other theologians to help us explore in greater detail the nature, provenance, and potency of grace. Perhaps like me, you need a little help knowing where to look for signs of grace in this particular moment. I'm reminded of a brief paragraph in Anthony Thistleton's one-volume Systematic Theology where with characteristic brevity, Thistleton summarizes Jesus' teaching on grace in the Synoptic Gospel tradition. He notes how in the parables of Jesus, especially the laborers in the vineyard, the Pharisees in the tax collector, or the prodigal son, Jesus sets examples of grace and generosity, which eclipse the fairness that we have in many of our human expectations. Around the world in our besieged cities, I wonder what it would look like to offer grace and generosity to one another, instead of what we would normally deem fair or otherwise expect in human interactions. What would it look like to be extravagantly kind to our neighbors, our co-workers, our enemies, or ourselves? I wonder how a moment of disruption like the one that we are experiencing now could open up the possibilities of the wonders of God's grace to be seen more clearly in our relationships and in our world.